characterizing this. And, and we can tell that uh, morphologically by the shape of the cell, if they look like pyramidal neurons. And we can tell it pharmacologically if we, if we do past plant recordings that they're not GABAergic neurons, they're, they're excitatory ones. So, so pretty much you can assume that for all these experiments, every single pyramidal neuron in the dish is expressing these. John? 65%. 65%. It depends on depends on how soon after you did the transfection too. They, John and Ming have done these beautiful time courses, and we're trying to get different um, serotypes of the adeno-associated virus that express quicker, so that we don't have to worry about this uh, not being fully expressing uh, the construct. Okay. And now to say a little bit something about what you can do with this. So as I mentioned, we're collaborating with Pete Wenner on homeostatic plasticity mechanisms. If you have never heard of that, it's basically slow learning. Any, anything that pushes on a biological system, usually the system pushes back and tries to maintain an even keel. And this is certainly true of most neural systems. And that's a process called homeostasis. And as I mentioned before, it's probably responsible for the fact that we get this population bursting. It's probably responsible for a lot of pathological neural activity, such as tetanus, and, you know, and people that are losing their hearing, uh, not tetanus, um, tinnitus. If they, if they hear ringing in their ears, it's probably because the system is not getting enough input. Uh, same thing goes for chronic pain, maybe epilepsy, certain kinds of <laughs> epilepsy. So there are a lot of clinical implications here. If we had a system for studying homeostatic plasticity in great detail, it could be very useful. And we think that in vitro systems uh, would um, fit the bill there. And then especially if you include optogenetics, like the octoclamp, you could control a variable and leave that set, kind of like you do with voltage clamp. You, know, you want to keep the voltage clamp at a certain value so you can study uh, various ion channels that are voltage sensitive. In this case, we're talking about clamping a whole network at a certain level to see what the effect of activity levels are on this, opto, on this homeostatic plasticity. So Ming Fei has, has become very good at doing intracellular recordings from these neurons that are growing on multi-electrode arrays. And when you do that, you can measure how strong the synapses are by looking at postsynaptic potentials. If you look at the amplitude of those, you can say, ah, oh, the synapses got stronger, they got weaker, as a result of some homeostatic plasticity. Uh, what I'm showing here is just some basic pharmacology, which is taking advantage of the fact that with MEAs, you can do these continuous recordings for days on end. And what she found out was that a drug that most people thought completely knocked out the activity of these cultures, CNQX, didn't. That uh, it did knock a lot of it out. But after a while, after a few hours, there was still quite a bit of activity, mostly these synchronized bursts. And then if you watch the drug out, it goes, um, you can see that it has a lot of activity, and in fact, it has even more activity than it did here. So that's thanks to the homeostatic uh, mechanism that because there was not as much activity during this drug block, uh, you end up with more activity after it's washed out. So that's uh, one of those pharmacological experiments. You wanted to know what was the effect of um, apoergic versus NMDA, ergic glutamatergic transmission. If you're in pharmacology, those probably mean something to you. Um, this drug CNQX blocks the APA receptors, and this drug APV blocks the NMDA receptors. Those are both glutamate receptors. And MDA seems to be much more involved with development and plasticity. AMPA seems to be the workhorse receptor for glutamate that's involved with most excitatory neurotransmission. Um, so <clears throat> what she found out was that the, the NMDA transmission was required for this bursting that comes back in the first couple of days. Uh, in other words, if you completely block it with APV, you don't see that stuff. But if you wait a little bit longer, you do see some bursting that's appearing. And that bursting that appears even later goes away completely if you block GABA. So this is an important lesson for, for people about bursting in general. But these networks tend to burst. They tend to want to do that. And, and there must be a lot of different mechanisms that cause this kind of synchronous bursting. It must be adaptive under certain circumstances. Um, and they. You know, different pharmacologies are involved. It's going to be complicated to disentangle all of this stuff, and the octoclamp is going to help 
her and uh, John do that. Okay, I think that's it for the data. I wanted to talk a little bit about something that's very important to me and to hopefully everybody in my lab, which is dissemination. We are engineers in the biomedical engineering department. Uh, not only do we want to do this cool research, but we also want to help others do it. So we're building a lot of technology that we share with other people to make sure uh, that they can do some similar experiments if they want to. One of the things that I did uh, more than a decade ago was to start a multi-photon interest group and also a multi-electron array interest group. Um, so these are online communities that share emails and announcements and whatnot. And it has really done a lot to bring these cultures together and share techniques and whatnot. Um, more recently, we've been sharing a lot of software and hardware in the form of this thing called NeuroWriter. It's a new version of something that Daniel Bacchanar created called Maybench that allows you to do multi-electrode array physiology stimulation, recording, optical stimulation. And John Newman and Riley Zeller Townsend have done a lot of reprogramming of NeuroWriter, basically completely reprogrammed it to do many more things that you should be able to do. And all of that stuff is open source. It's on the web. There are other users and other labs that are putting it to work for their interesting questions. We also have a lot of MEA data. MEAs can produce tons of data very quickly, and so we have shared a lot of that data. We have a server, and any scientist who wants to examine what multi-electrode array recordings are like and to look for more interesting uh, neural properties in there can log into the server and download that data. And there's been several papers published by independent labs using those data. Uh, we've been posting our publications on our webpage since 1994, since there were web pages. Um, I have yet to have a publisher come to me and say, please take that down. <laughs> and those of you who are afraid to put papers up online. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, in general, public publishers are becoming more open-minded to the idea of everybody should have access to this work if it's publicly funded. And we're sharing a lot of our methods. I'll, I'll show you a little example of that in just a moment. And also, I know this is a strange idea, but disseminating philosophy now, this is mostly my philosophy. Uh, I wouldn't say that everyone in the lab shares it with me, but um, I try to inculcate it into them sometimes here. So I'll tell you a little bit about that if I have a moment at the very end. Just two more slides. Uh, so in terms of methods dissemination, our most well-cited paper was this one from 2001 in which we uh, explain the new way to culture cells in these hermetically sealed chambers. They're sealed with a little Teflon membrane that's kind of like saran wrap. That keeps out the germs, it keeps them from evaporating, it keeps, uh, it allows the gases to pass through this membrane, carbon dioxide and oxygen can go through it, and it allowed us to grow a culture for two years. My first postdoc, Tom Gavars, kept a culture alive for two years, um, which as far as I know is still the world record for an oldest culture. So, uh, I don't think it's in the Guinness book yet. No. Uh, so, the postdoc in the lab, uh, formerly in the lab, Chad Hales, got very good at doing this culture, and he said, you know, enough people have asked us how to do this, we should do this uh, in video tutorial here. And so he created this Jove tutorial, which you can log into Jove and see. Here in the University School of Medicine. And I'm Chad Hales, a postdoc in Dr. Potter's lab. I'm also a cognitive behavioral fellow in the Department of Neurology at the University School of Medicine. Today we're going to be showing you how to culture and care for neurons on multi electrode arrays like these. We use them to study learning and memory in vitro and network information processing. So let's get started. <laughs> So, and so on. You can, you can read more <laughs> details yourself. I just wanted to give a small plug for Joe because I think if you have a method in your lab that you have perfected, maybe you didn't even invent it, you just do it very well, you should consider putting it up on there to share with other people. Okay, and then finally, in terms of dissemination of philosophy, uh, one of my unusual beliefs is that consciousness is a spectrum, that there isn't a sudden threshold where you suddenly are conscious, but there's all different levels of consciousness and it's not really fair to talk about some 
thing, special thing that people have that animals don't have or that animals have that other things don't have. Even the lowly bacterium is conscious of its chemical environment. It can swim up a chemical gradient. Uh, so there's all different levels of consciousness. Not everybody agrees with this. This is my personal belief. But it's one that I uh, mentioned when they were filming in the lab for this show called Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman. Is there anyone else who has seen this? Uh, okay. It's a little bit embarrassing because it was on an episode about the afterlife. I'm completely non-religious. But it turns out that the show did a very even-handed scientific treatment of the afterlife. But this view of consciousness has a shocking implication. If the soul is just a strange member of feedback loop, then it should not be unique to humans. Any sufficiently smart network should be able to experience it. Whatever it is, I have. You can find this Saturday train. point the way to a life beyond death. So, the answer to life beyond death is to export your brain to a culture dish, apparently. Um, so, one of the very specific questions that I would ask anybody who wants to discuss this stuff is where would you put the hybrids on this scale, you know? Semi-living animals have some sensitivity to their inputs, they respond. Uh, you know, if they're more to the right here, we have to start worrying about their rights and, and, and their pain and things like that. That kind of stuff, if you're interested in that sort of thing, is going to be discussed next Saturday at the Atlanta Science Tavern. I'm going to be leading a discussion there. So, uh, and, and I also recommend to log into the Neuroethics Program's Neuroethics blog, which has some excellent discussions, one written by Riley here, uh, on these kinds of things. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you for your attention. I thank all of these folks for doing all of the work.